So next, I want us to talk about the use effect hook. So what I'm going to do is inside my hooks folder, I'm going to create a new file called effect.js. And then inside here, I'm going to say RFC and then save that. And then I'm going to comment out the state here. And then I just want to render out the effect so that we don't have many components showing up on the screen. So now we should just have effect on the screen. So the use effect hook is used to run after effects in your application. So you can think of it as things that you want to run in the background and then update the UI. So you'll usually see the use effect hook being used together with the use state hook because they, they most of the time always go hand in hand. So if we jump into effect.js, the first thing we need to do is import the use effect hook. And then just like with the use state hook, we need to declare it on the top level of our component. So what we're going to do is inside the use effect, we're going to declare it and the syntax is as follows. It takes in a callback function and then an empty dependency array or rather not really an empty dependency array, but it takes in a dependency array. So you can pass this in or you can have it as that. Now, passing in a dependency array means the following. It means that the function inside the use effect is only going to run on the initial render of the application or rather of the component. But if you don't go ahead and pass in the empty dependency array, then it means that the use effect is going to be rerunning on every render of the application. So the dependency array can be your state value, for example. So if I have a state value here called seconds, for example, then it means that every time that the second state value is going to be updating, then the use effect is also going to rerun. And we're going to take a look at an example. So first of all, I want to show you a very basic example that we can use the use effect for. We can use it to change document titles. So I can say document.title is equal to, and then I'm going to say, this is the effect hook. And what you'll notice is the document title is going to update, as you can see right there. So that is just one example that you can use the use effect hook for. And then the second example is that we can use the use effect to fetch data from an API. So the way we do that is we need to go ahead and import the use state hook because the use state hook is going to be holding the data that we get from the API. So I need to declare my state value. So let me go ahead and say countries and set countries because I want to use an API that I like. So by default, I'm going to pass in an empty array because the data that we're going to be getting back from the API is going to be an array of objects. And then I'm going to create my function inside here. So an asynchronous function called get countries. And then inside here, I'm going to go ahead and pass in my fetch API. So this is just basically JavaScript syntax. So I can say const res is equal to await fetch. And then we're going to be fetching from the API. And then I'm going to say const data is equal to await res.json. And then I want to go ahead and populate the state value that you have. And remember how we do that is that we need to call this function to populate our state value. So I'm going to say set countries into the data that we're going to be getting back from the API. And then now, how do we call this function? We go ahead inside the use effect and then call the function that is called get countries. Now let's get this link to the API. Let me just remember it. Okay, so if you go ahead and Google rest countries API, then you're going to be met with this first link and you can simply open this link. And the link that we want is to get all the countries. So all right here and with this one right here. So this is the link. So just copy it and then paste it inside here. And then now, just to show you that it is working, let's go ahead and console log the data that we get back from the API. So save that. Let's jump back inside our application. Let's check the console and we should see an array of 250 items as you can see. So we are getting back something from the API. Now, once you get back the data from the API, what you can do is we can begin to display it on the screen. So because we're getting back an array, we can use array methods on it. So if I go ahead and say countries dot map, and then I say that for every country object that I get back, because when you map over an array, you get back the objects inside the array or rather the single elements inside the array. 
So I'm going to say that the single element that we get back, which in this case is going to be an object, I'm going to call it a country. So I'm going to say that for every country that we get back, I want to go ahead and render out an article with a key of countries dot, let me just check the API. Let's open this up because I've forgotten how this API is structured. It's loading in, it's low. Oh, wait, pretty print. Yes, that should do it. Okay. Oh, I don't have, I don't have the extension installed that, that wants this to be much better looking. Anyway, so you can see that we get back an array and then it is an array of objects inside. So I want to get the name.common. So I can say countries.name.common and then close this out. So this is the unique key. Remember the purpose of the unique key. And then inside the article, let's find out an H2 that says the countries, oh, you're not country because that is the object. So this should be country. So country.name.common. And what we should see on the screen is 250 country names, as you can see right there. And you can scroll all the way to the bottom. So just by doing that, you can see that we can fetch data from an API. So in our next example, and you know what, uh, let, me, let me see how do I do this. I think I'm just going to comment this out so that you can have the examples inside here. And I've just remembered to mention something that never ever make the use effect asynchronous with the simple reason that an asynchronous function returns a promise and the use effect cannot return a promise. So you can make the functions inside the use effect. So you can grab this from here and place it inside the use effect and you can make the function asynchronous, but the use effect itself cannot be asynchronous. So you cannot make it an asynchronous function anywhere. Okay. So just take note of that. Take note of that. It is going to be very helpful. And then something else that I've just remembered is this. If you have your function inside here and perhaps you want to have an on click. So let's say that you want to have a button inside here that says fetch countries, fetch countries, right? You can have an on click on the button here that calls the function that is called get countries, countries, right? But the problem with this, see already how it is like highlighted, it has three dots. It's because if you have your function inside the use effect, then it is not going to be accessible inside your component. So you have to grab the function and place it outside of the use effect in order for it to be accessible as you can see. So just take note of that, it is going to be quite helpful for you. So let me go ahead and comment this out and then comment this out. And then we can begin to talk about how we can use the use effect to create a custom timer. So in order to create a timer, the logic is very similar to JavaScript. So we need to first of all have a value that stores this, the timer. So we're going to create our state values. In this case, I'm going to say seconds and set seconds because we want to make a timer of 60 seconds. And then use state by default is going to be 60 seconds. So you can have numbers inside here. And I've just remembered to mention something. The use effect can be initialized to practically anything. So you can have it as just like this. You can have it as null. You can have it as an array. You can have it as an array of objects. So you can say something like name of, let me say my name. And then job, let me say front end web dev. And then you can create another object. Inside here, you can have another object as name. So let me do that. Let me say job back and developer. So you can do something like that. So you can have it as an array of objects, such as in this case. So basically any type of data structure that you want, you can pass it inside the use effect. So by default for this example, I want it to be defaulted to 60 seconds because there are 60 seconds in a minute. Now, once we do that, then I'm going to call my use effect and then pass in my callback function. And then for this one, I don't want to have a dependency array because I want this use effect to rerun for every render. Now, how do you know that it's going to run for every render? Because in React, anytime that you update state, then it causes your application to re-render or that causes the component to re-render. So just by having it like this, I know that this use effect is going to run for every re-render. So inside here, I'm going to say const timeout. Const timeout is equal to set timeout. 
and this is a JavaScript function. And then we're going to say this, we're going to say set seconds, which is the function that controls how we access our state value. And we're going to say seconds minus one, meaning we want to decrement it for every second. And the way we do that in the set timeout is we pass in a thousand milliseconds because a thousand milliseconds is one second. Now, if I go ahead and save that, and you know what, let's not save it first, let's go ahead and render the seconds to the screen. So let's just go below this and then let's render out seconds. I can save that and then look what happens. We can see that our timer is already working. It is working, right? But look at this. If I go ahead and set this to something like five, it goes five, four, three, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two. So there's no timer that goes into the negative unless it is something like, um, what is it, a degree uh, temperature thing, what's it called? Thermometer, unless it's the thermometer. <laughs> so what you need to do is we need to check for whether the seconds value is less than zero. And if it is less than zero, then you just want to reset it, right? Or that we want to break out of it. So I'm going to say if seconds is less than or equal to zero, then we just simply want to say return. Now, if I go ahead and save that, now it's going to say five. Uh, oh, it already broke out of this because this condition has already evaluated to true. So let's reload. So five, four, three, two, one, zero, and then zero. Because we're checking for whether seconds is less than zero or equal to zero. And if that is the case, then you can simply say return. Now, instead of just doing this, what you can do is you can go ahead and say this. We can say set seconds into 60 seconds. So take it back to 60 by default. So I can save that. And what you'll see is that it goes back to 60. And of course, it was already going running, but five, four, three, two, one, zero, and then it goes back to 60, right? And then the timer just starts all over again. But did you see something there? That is a bug that I was not expecting. Let me just check it out again. So five, four, three, two, one, and then it goes back, okay. So probably I should check for whether this is less than zero so that the timer goes down all the way to zero. So I'll reload it once again. So five, four, three, two, one, zero, and then 60. Okay, that is much better. That is a much better timer. Now, the problem with this is that we are adding this kind of set timeout. So what will happen in our application is that this function is going to rerun even when the component has finished mounting. So for example, if I were to navigate into another page, so if I had another page theoretically, then this component still runs even on that page. And even if this component is not showing on that page, it is still running in the background. Now, that is a very bad thing because what it does is that it's going to cause memory leaks in your application and it is something that I have done before. I have actually crashed a client website. Uh, what's this? Close that. I have actually crashed a client website because of something like this in my use effect. So how we fix that is we need to go ahead and add in what is called a cleanup function. Now, how do you know that you need a cleanup function? Whenever you're adding something like an event listener or a timer such as this, for example, in your use effect, then you need a cleanup function. And it looks like this. We simply say return, and then we want to go ahead and scroll. In this case, we want to say clear timeout. So clear, what am I typing? Clear timeout, and then clear timeout, and then we want to go ahead and pass in our timeout, which is basically on the top. So that now when I save that, now our use effect is going to be looking very fresh, very nice. So five, four, three, two, one, zero, and then it starts again. So that now, even when the component is finished mounting, then the use effect is also going to break and it's not going to cause an infinite loop. So that is how you can use the use effect hook. And in the next video, we're going to talk about how we can build custom hooks.